Good morning, everyone. Um, it is good to be able to worship with you today, uh, and, and especially on a, a Father's Day, because uh, the topic uh, can be kind of relevant. Uh, Jonah chapter 1, 17, verses 2 to 6. It's all about avoiding storms because of righteousness. And what that means is, is that a lot, of, a lot of storms that happen in our lives um, are a result not necessarily of God sending them. Um, we, I, I think there are times where God will send certain things in our lives that we're not expecting. But a lot of the times when, when things happen in our lives, when we feel overwhelmed, it's really because of our own doing. It's really because of our own doing uh, that we're kind of, kind of uh, uh, suffering these things. Uh, nine times out of ten, that's usually the case if you ask people. You really dig deep down, and they I will actually finally admit, okay, yeah, well, this is, this is a, a result of me and the choices that I made in life. Uh, um, and the message today is kind of saying that, look, we can avoid these kinds of things uh, if we choose to live more righteously. You know, and a lot of these storms are, are not necessary. And this is really relevant, especially to us as fathers, you know, in Father's Day, uh, is that whether we are the kinds of dads who like to proactively lead the family, you know, or the kinds of dads who just are kind of very passive and let other people lead the family, um, every choice we make, whether to be active, whether to be passive, is going to make a difference. It's going to affect the wife, our wives. It's going to affect the children, and it affects our coworkers. So every decision that we make, if we're trying to avoid storms, you know, uh, uh, it, will, it will impact somebody. Um, just last week, you'll see that uh, um, my son gave me uh, a haircut, the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, the North Korean dictator look, and uh, maybe, uh, maybe it's a subtle message from him. That's what he, how he views me. You know? So, so I got to be careful. I got to be careful about how I, I even lead my kids, right? You know, sometimes I'm, I tend to be a little bit more proactive than maybe, maybe, maybe a lot of dads out there. Uh, but he may be sending me a message, and, uh, and so um, it's true. Whatever I do, whatever choices I make, how I, lead, you know, how I lead my life, it will affect him as well. And so this is, this is, uh, this is Jonah in a nutshell. This is what we're getting into. Uh, we are, are now finding him not on the boat anymore, but in the midst of a sea. And the question really is, was this storm avoidable? I mean, was, was his situation completely avoidable? And, and if we read the context of Jonah, yeah, it was pretty avoidable. But it doesn't matter. He's in the sea now. He's in the sea now. And so what's going to happen now that he's in the sea? So before we begin, let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word and how it really just uh, blesses us and, and really gives us insight as to who you are as a God. Um, how even though we mess up a lot of times in life, even though we are the victims of our own choices and decisions, apart from you, Lord Father God, that if you are willing, you are still able to draw us back. And you draw us back in amazing ways, such that it is so clear that you are alive and that you are uh, 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 loving and gracious and you are pulling us back to you. And we thank you that this is the kind of God we worship. May you continue to be glorified and honored and praised in our lives. We, we praise you, Lord Jesus, in your name. Amen. Amen. So have you ever had one of those experiences uh, in life in which uh, you knew you did something wrong. Okay? You, you did something wrong, and, and in order to cover yourself, <laughs> you just kept going deeper and deeper and deeper into this, this, this thing. Well, um, one of the experiences, to, to give you an example of this, one of the experiences I remember clearly was when, uh, it, was, it was someone in my elementary school, okay? It wasn't me. I, seriously, this one wasn't me. Okay, it was in my elementary school when I was in fourth or fifth grade, and uh, this guy, he was bragging to everyone in the class, especially all the, all the boys, he's bragging to everyone in the class about his Atari 2600 game system, right? Atari 20, and and if, I know you guys are probably going, what the heck is an Atari 2600? If you don't know what an Atari 2600 is, uh, think about it as the Wii or the Xbox or the PlayStation of your generation, okay? So he was, he was bragging about his, his, his video game console um, to everyone in our class. And uh, mind you, I, I never had a video game system growing up. My parents didn't let me have a video game system growing up. That's kind of why I'm more of an outdoors type person, because, you know, I couldn't do anything, so just go out and play. All right, you know, so, so I did. You know, scorpions and salamanders and all those kinds of things, you know, snakes. It's a different kind of danger. But uh, uh, that's kind of how I grew up. So I, I, didn't really, I didn't really care one way or the other. So his, his, kind of, his kind of bragging never really affected me. But... Anyway, this, this guy would just brag every day about how many video games he had and about this, you know, all these high scores he kept getting, such that it would make my other friends really mad. 
It made him really mad. And so I just happened to mention one day, because I was kind of a third party in all this, I just kind of mentioned one day, it's like, hey, why don't, you know, if you're so suspicious, why don't you just go to his house and, and see his Atari? Right? Just go to his house and check it out. And all my friends, they thought, it was like, that's a great idea. You know, like these guys, that's, that's awesome. I, you know, you're a genius. It's like, yeah, I know I am. But, you know, there's like saying, you know, uh, uh, yeah, we should go do this. Because none of my other friends actually had ever seen this guy's Atari system. And they never knew that, that, that you know, they said, yeah, I've never, I've never, I didn't even know that he got this thing. And, you know, and, and, and sometimes when he explains how he got certain scores, I'm thinking to myself, no, that's not how you get it. You know, and they were starting to get suspicious. So we all, as a group, we all went to this guy's house. And uh, when we knocked on his door, you know, lo and behold, his mom answers the door, right? And, and one of my friends asks, can we see this guy's Atari system, right? And then his mom, starts, she starts laughing incredulously. And then she says, hey, son, come over here. Did you tell all these boys you had an Atari system? You know? And, and I remember this guy, uh, he came to the door, and he was so embarrassed that he started crying. He started crying, and he tried to shut the door. But his mom stopped him from closing the door. His mom stopped him from closing the door, and she said, son, you got to apologize to these guys for lying. you got to apologize for lying. So through his tears, he said, oh, I'm sorry, I, I lied about having an Atari. You know, it was like a really pitiful sight, actually. And, and you know, we were, we were just trying to be just, you know, we were indig indignant. We were just trying to be truth finders. You know, let's see if this guy has an Atari system or not. You know, and, and, and after we saw him crying and, and saying, you know, I'm so sorry, you know, we just kind of became a bunch of softies. You know, it's like, oh, you know, well, that's, that's not what we wanted to see. You know, we wanted to make you feel bad, but now you really feel bad. I'm sorry, I wanted to make you feel bad. I really did, you know. And, and, and then I, I remember one of my friends just said to me, you know, it's okay, it's okay, you know. I've lied about things before, too. You know, trying to tell me, I've lied about things before, too. And then we all started chiming in about how we've lied before, too. You know, me just a little bit, you know, like, I just lied. And, 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 you know, we said, you know, don't feel so bad. You know, don't, don't feel so bad. And, um, and after this, we do what all kids do. We just asked his mom, hey, can you come out and play? You know, and I remember from, you know, and we just kind of wiped his tears and, and put on his shoes and we just all went out to the park. You know, that's just how it is. Um, and I remember from then on, we never really talked much about Atari, Atari 2600 again. Nobody really cared after that. No one really cared after that. Um, and it's not until last Christmas, you know, for uh, now that we're coming to the present day, it's not until last Christmas um, that um, we actually, someone actually gave us an Atari 2600 system, you know. Uh, uh, one of those little retro game things and has every game on it. And I haven't played on it yet because you know, I, I lost that desire many years ago. Um, but uh, that's just, you know, it comes back to haunt you every now and then. Um, but in our passage today, uh, we kind of want to make this correlation because we see in our passage today, uh, Jonah's rebellion towards God, Jonah's uh, insistence upon running away from God, it has finally caught up to him. It caught up to him. He's now getting exposed. And, but in the case of Jonah, things are 100 times worse. You know, he just didn't get caught in a lie. He got overthrown in, in, in the ship, in the boat, into a raging ocean. You know, so I'd say his situation was, was 100 times worse. You know, because of Jonah's rebellion, because he was the one who rebelled against God first, Jonah was suffering and, and he was going to suffer the consequences of his sin, such that I believe, and you know, a lot of people are, are divided on this. If you talk to other pastors or other scholars, a lot of people are, are divided on this. But for me, I honestly think that uh, he suffered the consequences of his sins, even to the extent that Jonah, he literally died. Basically, he literally, he literally drowned. I believe he literally drowned before he was brought back to life again in this fish. But the amazing thing about this passage is this. The amazing thing about this passage is this that even though the consequences of Jonah's sins, even though Jonah brought these consequences upon himself, God is still merciful to Jonah. That's the amazing thing about our passage today. God is still merciful to Jonah. And God's extraordinary mercy is what clearly stands out in our passage today. Why is God so, so, you know, merciful to this guy? You know, that's going to be the thing that clearly stands out in our passage today. And it will not make sense in chapter 2, of Jonah, the book of Jonah, but when you read, start reading chapter 3 and chapter 4 of Jonah, then it starts to make a whole lot of sense. But for now, we're, we're trying to figure out, like, why? You know, it's, we're supposed to be amazed at this point and say, why would God be willing, you know, to save this guy, uh, even though he should be dying of his sins? So, 
Although our passage today, our passage today begins with a big fish that swallows Jonah whole. It didn't just nibble on Jonah like you saw a shark attack or anything like that. It swallowed him whole. Although our passage begins with a big fish swallowing Jonah whole, this is actually the last thing that happens to Jonah, you know, after he drowns. This is actually the last thing that happens after he drowns. And the reason why it's put first is you'll see uh, chapter 2 is basically a poetic structure. So it begins with a fish swallowing him, it ends with a fish spitting him out. So that was all basically, uh, that's, that's poetry. Uh, but for now, you need to under, we need to understand the order is that although it's mentioned first that he was swallowed by this, this big fish, it doesn't happen until after he's pulled to the bottom of the ocean, okay? So that's where we're going to start today. And in fact, the overarching metaphor of this section, the, 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 the message that we're going to talk about today in chapter 2, it revolves around the same, same issue that we had in chapter 1. And that is the concept of going down, going down deeper and going down to the deepest level, right? Uh, that, that, that before uh, the metaphor is going to change to rising, 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 that he gets out of the ocean, it's all talking about, we're going to talk today about going down, down, down. And, 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 and that's what the writer of, of Jonah is trying to say, is that when we get caught in our own sins, when we start to get caught in rebellion, there is no other direction for us to go but down and down further and even down more. You know, just like in chapter 1, it was Jonah, he voluntarily, he goes down to Joppa, and, and, and he goes down to Joppa in order to go down to Tarshish, uh, and then he goes down into the interior of the ship. We, 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 we talked about this, this all the time. It, it's, it's funny, in, in chapter 1, it's always talking about this Jonah, God says, arise, and Jonah goes down, down, down. Well, God says, you want to go down? That's fine. I'll take you down, and I'll take you down to a place where you will never want to go again. And, and that's kind of where we're, we're at in chapter 2. You know, you think it's, it's Jonah who's voluntarily going down to the ship in chapter 1. Well, how do you like it now in chapter 2 when Jonah continues to go down even further, but this time it's involuntarily. It's involuntary, and, and he's thrown into this ocean, into this raging sea, in order for him to really feel like what it, what it is to go down. You want to rebel against God? You will feel what it feels like to rebel against God. You will feel the consequences of that. And so in, in verse 3, in verse 3, even though Jonah assigns blame to God, he says, Lord, you know, Yahweh, you're the one who threw me into the ocean, <laughs> which is not true, by the way, according to chapter 1. Uh, we see that the first part of Jonah's journey is going down into the ocean, and, and he's experiencing these tremendous sea waves, you know, this rolling and crashing over his head, uh, and, as he's in the middle of the sea, and he has nothing to hold on to. Right? I don't know if you guys have ever swam in a, in, in a, in a lake. You know, that's not even as bad. Or if you guys even try swimming in an ocean and you go to the middle of it and you find out, oh man, there's nothing that will hold me when I'm going up and down. You know, I have nothing except for my limbs to, to keep me afloat. You know, I'm completely vulnerable in this situation. And Jonah is kind of like in the middle of the Mediterranean thrown into this situation and he has nothing that he gets to hold on to. So in Jonah chapter 2, verses 3, we see Jonah's predicament. He says, For you, Yahweh, you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the floods surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. So he's there going up and down, bobbing, and these waves are still going over his head, you know, and, and, and kind of just, just crashing over him. Uh, then we continue to read Jonah's progression. It's not just on the surface of the water. Now he's progressively going down in verse 5. He explains the progression downward into the ocean as now the seaweed and the vegetation is starting to wrap around his face and, and kind, of, kind of pull him down, you know, uh, um, they're dragging him down into the ocean even further. Jo Jonah chapter 2, verse 5. He says, now it's not just the sea billows rolling over my head. In verse 5, the waters are now closing over me to take my life. The deep is surrounding me, weeds are wrapping all around my head. It's as if like some giant squid or some, some giant octopus is grabbing him and circling him and it's trying to drag and pull him down slowly, slowly, slowly to now where we see in verse 6 that Jonah has made it all the way down to the floor of the Mediterranean, to the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea, such that if Jonah were to open his eyes, and we know he probably experienced this before the fish because he's seeing all of this happen before his eyes. You know, in the belly of a fish, you can see nothing, right? So he's seeing, he's seeing the roots of the mountains. I see the very bottom of the mountains. Not only do I see the root of the mountains, I am being pummeled into the sandbar. You know, the sand that's the surrounding on the ocean floor. I'm being pummeled into these sandbars, which are going to bury me as if I were going to be buried in an unmarked grave. 
Nobody will ever be able to visit me down here. Nobody cares about me. This is going to be my final resting spot. Yahweh is burying me at the bottom of the mountain in the sea in a sandbar. Jonah chapter 2, verse 6. He's going down, down, down at the roots of the mountain. I see the roots of the mountain. I went down to the land whose bars have closed upon me forever. It used to be the waves over my head and progressively it's the seaweed dragging me down even to the point where now I'm seeing the sand in the bottom of the mountain. That's how far uh, you know, I am from God and this is the consequence of what it means to run away from God. God says, you want to run? Fine. That's where you get to run to. That's what it means to be apart from me. And all of these images and these, these experiences that Jonah has it suggests to me that within a matter of seconds, or even if this took a minute, I don't know how long it took, Jonah saw and he experienced all of these things as he was pulled to the bottom of the ocean as the salt water is beginning to fill his lungs. And if you've ever swam in the ocean, you've, you've just tasted one swallow of salt water. Oh my God, it's the nastiest thing in the world, right? And you know, his lungs are being filled with salt water. He's being pulled to the bottom. I don't know, some kind of vortex or whatever. He's just going straight down. It's got to be a matter of seconds or even at worst a minute, you know, where he's seeing all this stuff happening to himself. And, and depending on how long things look, you know, Jonah, he was either on the verge of drowning, he's either on the verge of drowning, or as I believe, he had drowned. He already had drowned for a short period, and he had drowned for a short period of time before God sends the big fish to swallow him up. Before God sends this big fish to swallow him up. Now, when reading the book of Jonah, the question that most people have is this. They try to get all scientific on you, right? And they say, is it even natural or physiologically, phys physiologically possible for a big fish, let alone any fish, to swallow a man whole, to keep him in his stomach for three days and to vomit him out on dry land? Is that even possible? And the answer I always give to these people is like, Yes, it's absolutely possible. It's absolutely naturally, physically, whatever you want to say, it's absolutely possible for a big fish to swallow Jonah. Simply because the sender of the big fish is none other than Yahweh himself. Is none other. So the same Yahweh that Jonah says, if this is the same Yahweh, Yahweh we're talking about, who rules over the heavens, who rules over the lands, who rules over the seas, that is the same Yahweh who is the creator God and who has made all forms of life. So no, it's not surprising to me that a big fish could do this or that even a custom-made fish that Yahweh made could do this. That's not the unbelievable part, right? So this has never really been a stumbling block to me. It's not a, one of those stumbling block questions for me since we have observed in nature, phys, you know, apart from this, this story, we have observed in nature physiologically or physiological specimens such as sperm whales and killer whales that do have throats big enough to swallow a man. We know that that kind of stuff exists, okay? So it's, it's, not, it's not impossible to believe. So God creating a fish to do the same thing, that doesn't shock me. And as believers, it shouldn't shock you. You, know, you don't get stumbled by this kind of stuff. Can a fish do this? It's like, yeah, if we're talking about God, anything is possible. You know, that's not the problem. However, what does shock me, and kind of what, what, what should shock you, is why? Why does God bother to save Jonah at all? Why save this guy at all? That's the more shocking question. Why would God go through great lengths, call a fish to go find him or custom make this fish, you know, to go find Jonah? Why would God do this to swallow this man? Why would God even do that in the first place? Um, why does God bother to say Jonah at all? We know because Jonah is the one who rebelled and he was the potential cause of death of all the people aboard the ship going to Tarshish. It was his fault that they were about to die, right? Even Jonah admits it. So why not let Jonah drown in his punishment? Why not? You're a just God. We should just let this guy, let this guy suffer the punishment. Just like, just like you know, Judas for killing Jesus. You just, you know, or Pharaoh for, for, for trying to keep the Jews, uh, the Hebrews in, in Egypt. Just, just you know, let him suffer and, and die. Why, why all this mercy on Jonah? You know, that's not, that's, not, uh, the, the, that's not justice, Lord. I mean, when you read the text in terms of literary expression, we are set up for Jonah's death. We should be expecting his death the minute Jonah expresses to Yahweh, the minute Jonah says one phrase. And, and the, the, the minute Jonah says one phrase and he says, you, Yahweh, you are the one, you know, uh, in verse 2, who cast me into the sea. You cast me into the sea. And this is because the implication of being cast into the sea, especially by Yahweh, or the word, the biblical word cast, 
to throw in, it always connotes certain death. It always connotes death. It always connotes. It is spoken of as the means by which Joseph's brothers, they choose to kill him. Remember, everyone was, was, was jealous of Joseph, all his brothers from Reuben, Judah, all the way on down. They, they, they hated Joseph. They wanted to kill him. Well, in Genesis chapter 37, verse 20, in Genesis 37, verse 20, this is what it says. It says, the brothers came, came to, with each other. They conspired with each other. And they said, come now, let us kill him and cast him into one of the pits. Then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him, and we will see what will become of his dreams. Right? They hated Joseph because he was a dreamer. And so the little Hebrew word is that we will kill him. We will cast him into one of these pits. You know, that guy's as good as dead. That's, that's the same word that Jonah says to Yahweh. You cast me into the sea. But if you're not convinced by that, there's another even stronger expression of how the word cast is being used. And it is spoken of by Pharaoh in regards to killing Pharaoh, in regards to killing all the male Hebrew children, uh, all the male boys of, of, the, of the Hebrews, in Exodus chapter 1, verse 22. This is how Pharaoh uses the word cast. In Exodus 1, 22, it says, Then Pharaoh commanded the people, Every son that is born to the Hebrews, you shall cast into the Nile. Cast into the Nile, but you shall let the daughters live. Yes, we like the girls. We know that we could always uh, make them give birth to uh, Egyptian boys, uh, but what we can't have is Hebrew boys. So you will cast them into the Nile because that will ensure their certain death. That's irony, right? Complete irony as Yahweh casts the Egyptian army into the Red Sea, right? Uh, that's, that's, that's coming. So be careful what you say and be careful what decisions you make because it can come back to haunt you, right? So Yahweh himself then, after Pharaoh uses that term, Yahweh himself also uses the term to cast, uh, to imply sudden death to the Egyptian army. And he says this in Exodus chapter 15, verse 4 to 5, through Moses' psalm. Exodus 15, 4 to 5. Moses says this, Pharaoh's chariots and his host, Yahweh, cast into the sea, and his chosen officers were sunk in the Red Sea. The floods covered them. This is sounding like Jonah, right? The floods covered them. They went down into the depths like a stone. They went down into the depths like a stone. That sounds like Jonah, right? Jonah... You will see as you read the, his book, he is very knowledgeable about God. He knows God really well. It is probably really clear Jonah knows the story in Exodus. He knows that when he is saying, you cast me into the sea, he's thinking, oh my gosh, you have now treated me like an Egyptian soldier. Not only have you cast me into the sea, but the floods are covering me, and I am going down like they are going down, like a stone to the bottom of the ocean. So it's not surprising to us. It shouldn't be surprising to us. And, and, and it's, 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 I mean, it, it, it is surprising to us, and it's probably more surprising to Jonah, that when Yahweh casts him into the sea, on the one hand, Yahweh allows the casting into the sea, that soon enough, Yahweh rescues Jonah by providing him a way of salvation. That he rescues Jonah by providing him a way of salvation. Jonah knows, once he is revived from death, Maybe he's in the belly of a fish, and the, and the fish is trying to uh, digest him, so it's squishing his heart like this, and blah, the seawater's coming out of his mouth, and all of a sudden Jonah revives. Jonah knows that once he becomes conscious of himself, he knows that this is an unusual circumstance, and he does not deserve salvation. He knows, oh my goodness, I saw, the last thing I saw were sandbars with being buried under the sand. Now I wake up in a dank, dark place, you know, um, but I am alive. And he says, I do not deserve this kind of salvation. And so Jonah is very thankful for his life when he becomes conscious that he is alive, albeit alive in the belly of a fish. Okay, albeit alive in the belly of a fish. I mean, can you imagine what it would feel like to be alive inside the belly of a fish? Can you imagine what that would feel like? Most likely, it's dark inside that fish, right? I don't see, like, he doesn't have a flashlight or a lamp, you know, let me, let me do my waterproof matches and you know, light up to see where I am. He's dark inside the fish. He can't tell time. How long have I been in here? I don't know. You know, like, it's, it's so dark. It's, it's, you know, I don't know how long I've been in this fish. Most likely, you know, he's, he's, he's confused about time. That, that, you know, this, this is like feeling it's, last, it's lasting forever. And why would he be confused? Because he stayed in that fish for 72 hours. He stayed in there for three days. And most likely, we know, if we've seen fish, that it's probably really humid inside of a fish. 
that it's, it's most likely smelly. You know, it's a, you got the fish smell. You have this fish who's eating, and his stomach has these gastric juices and fluids drenching all over Jonah. He's like, oh, gross, I'm in a slime pit. You know, I don't know what, what I'm doing. You know, and he's like saying, this is, this is the grossest thing I've ever felt in my life. And the fact that he might have be, been cramped inside this fish, he's cramped inside the fish. We don't know whether he's prone, whether he's on his, his face, or whether he's supine, whether he's on his back. But I tell you what, he probably wasn't standing straight up and down. He's probably like sideways or inside this fish, whether on his back or on his stomach. We don't know. So he's, he's floating around inside a cramped, dark, smelly fish, not knowing where he's going. You know, it's really dark for days and days and days. And for people who, who if, if you're claustrophobic, you know, and you can't stand tight spaces, you know, well, sorry, you're out of luck if you're Jonah. You know, that's, that's, that's what's going to happen to you, right? And he's probably, if it's a tight, tight, cramped place, he's probably immobilized. He cannot move around. He cannot stretch his arms or legs. He cannot go pee or poo. Okay, three days. He cannot go, and you know, he cannot go pee or poo. If you were held within strict confines with, for three days and you had to go pee or poo, that means you're peeing and you're pooing all over yourself. Cool, nasty in other words, right? Even, you know, and, and maybe you were thirsty for three days. And all you have is that nasty salt water and you're still trying to get it out of your system. You're still trying to get it out of your mouth. You know, it's no wonder... No wonder Jesus compares himself, you know, Jesus, Jesus says that, you know, huh, compares to being in a coffin and, 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 and being in the ground similar to Jonah's experience. Remember, Jesus says the same thing, you know, he says, in, uh, uh, he says that, that it's, it's like, you know, you will not get a, a sign except for the sign of Jonah or the son of man is going to be in the ground for three days just like Jonah was in the fish for three days. That's going to be your only miracle. Right? And Jesus calls this it's itself, you know, Jesus calls this a miracle because when you're thinking about it, that's gross. That's really gross that Jonah had to endure it, but it was a miracle. It was a miracle. And so, so when you look at all the things that Jonah had to suffer for three days, you can say to yourself, look, Jonah did suffer for his sins. That, if, if that's not suffering for your sins, okay, like God is just, okay? God says, you cannot escape a certain amount of suffering for what you did to me, Jonah. Okay, and that will be it. But, that's a lot better than losing your life, right? I'd rather pee and pull myself for three days instead of lose my life, you know? And, and so it's, it's, it is what it is. He still had to suffer. He still had to, had to you know, pay for what he did. Um, but the overarching thing that was happening to him was that he was being saved. So despite his condition and his suffering, despite anything else he could think of or, or do for the next few days, you know, this is the amazing thing about Jonah, okay? Despite, so if you were stuck in a fish, you know, kind of like this, or on your back, you know, side saying, hmm, what am I going to do? How long am I going to be here? You know, what would you be thinking of, right? Pounding this fish, maybe it will go to the surface. I don't know. You know, oh, if I pound the fish, maybe it will go down. So I don't know. I'll try to stay as still as possible. I don't know where I'm at. What would you be thinking about doing for three days. What would, you be, what would be going through your mind for three days? That despite the suffering, despite the condition that Jonah was in, you know, for the next three days, Jonah says, this is what I'm going to do. And Jonah composes one of the most beautiful psalms of thanksgiving to Yahweh. And he composes this beautiful psalm of thanksgiving to Yahweh for living, for life. For life. Even though he's composing the psalm, inside the belly of a fish. And in order to do that, he has to memorize this psalm. He has to construct it in his mind. He has to memorize it. He has to keep saying it over and over and over to himself, not knowing how long he was going to be inside, because he does not want to forget the song. So he's constructing this thing mentally, thinking about it, saying these verses over and over and over to himself. And he writes this song. The reason why he writes this song Okay, it's just like, just like he's, this is how he leaves his legacy. He writes this song because he wants the world to know. He wants the world to know that even though he suffered a lot, even, even through Jonah's suffering, he wants people to know that at every step of the way, Jonah reflects and he sees God sustaining him even at this deep, dark point in his life. Even though this was a, a punishment of his own making, he still sees God at every step of his life. Jonah chapter 2, verse 2 to 6. I called out to Yahweh, I called out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, I, I cried really hard to him, and you heard my voice. 
For Yahweh, you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves, all your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight. I will never see land again. I will never see your temple again. But I shall look upon your holy temple again. That means I will be saved. The waters closed over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head and at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Yahweh, my God. I know what has happened to me. I know where I should be. I know I should be dead. I cried and I pleaded. I said, I'm so sorry. I... I, I won't do this again, you know, please have mercy on me. And I did go down to the pit, but you still brought me up, Yahweh, because you are my God. You know, while most people think, you know, they're reading this, 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 this narrative, and most people think, you know, being stuck in a big fish is certain death. Man, you thought you were rescued? You actually died, man. You're going to be digested by this fish. You know, most people think that, that, that this, this stuck in a big fish is certain death. Jonah understands his situation is certain salvation. It is certain salvation. Because Jonah knows, Jonah knows that if he, if he is even able to wake up after drowning, if he is able to even get his life back, if he is able to resurrect, to arise, whatever you want to call it, out of his, his, you know, out of, out of his death, if he is able to vividly recall the ocean, the waves, the seaweeds wrapping around him, seeing the bottom of, 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 the, of the mountain, seeing the sand, if he is able to breathe, let alone compose a psalm of thanksgiving in his mind, if Jonah is able to do all of these things, then Jonah becomes certain, God must have saved me for a reason. <laughs> right? If I can have all this stuff and, and be you know, kind of restored in this way, that Jonah is certain that Yahweh will, will rescue me and I will see land again. Otherwise, our God is a really cruel God, huh? Nah, I just saved you just to see, show you that I could save you. Then I'm going to make you die again. You know, that's not the God Jonah worships. He said, if God went through all this trouble to save me in this way, he is going to let me see land again. And we see the extraordinary lengths that Yahweh is willing to go to show himself and also to prove himself. This is not just a God that you worship me from afar. God says, and I will also come into your life to show you that I am God by doing things in your life. First of all, God brings a raging storm that scares professional sailors to death. Right? We talked about the people on the boat. They're used to sailing from, from Joppa to, to, to Spain. They're used to going that distance. And so when they see this storm coming up, they say, this is an unusual storm. These are professionals. These are not just, just amateur sail, you know, seamen. They are, are complete uh, uh, professionals who, who know what a storm is like. And, and Yahweh brings this raging storm to scare them to death, to show them, you're not in control of the oceans. I don't care how well you know your boat. Yahweh says, I can, I can make a storm that will tear your boat apart. Even your boat will start thinking, maybe I should tear myself apart. Okay. Second of all, Yahweh calms the storm once the sailors throw Jonah overboard. It says once they threw him overboard, whoosh, immediate calm. Right? <laughs> That's not what was going on for Jonah, but as far as the boat was concerned, the storm completely stopped. And then how else does Yahweh work? Yahweh now saves Jonah through a big fish. Finds him in the sandbar, spits away the sand, swallows him up, takes, you know, pumps his stomach, whatever it is, so that, so that Jonah is able to live again. And, and in order to rescue him this way, and what we see is we catch a glimpse of God's heart. We catch this glimpse of God's heart. That God's intention, like we talked about last week in the passage of Ezekiel, God's intention is not to destroy people, even if they deserve it. God does want to save people at all costs, but God is only willing to save people if they turn from their sins and they turn from rebelling against him. That's, that's the only thing that needs to happen. That's the only thing God is asking for. I will do my part, you do your part, in saying that you will stop rebelling against me. This is why God wanted Jonah to speak to Nineveh in the first place. He's telling Jonah, Nineveh is in trouble. They need to, they need to have an opportunity to repent. You know, and that's the thing Jonah wanted to run away from. No, 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 Lord, I want you to kill him. I want him to die. I want him to suffer. You know, don't ever rescue them from the ocean. Let them drown. Right? That's Jonah's heart at this point, right? Until it happens to him, right? And then it's like, you know, oh, this is, this, is who, this is who my God is. That even if it's the Ninevites, God still wants to save them. But just as significantly, we, we learn about Yahweh, but just as significantly, we also learn something about Jonah as well. 
And that as we said before, as you will see demonstrated throughout Scripture, Jonah knows, Jonah knows God really well. He does know God really well. You know, Jonah may be rebellious. Jonah may have done a very stupid thing in his life. But Jonah is no fool when it comes to understanding God and God's nature. In fact, the greatest thing to me, the greatest thing about this psalm, when I, when I, when I read this psalm that Jonah composes, the greatest thing that, that comes to my mind is, is, that, is that Jonah, Jonah you know, has this tendency to just thank God and praise God for his salvation, that, that, that he's in this fish, he doesn't know what's really going to happen to him, but yet he has the understanding that he is already going to thank and praise God. That Jonah has already thanked and praised God, that he's written this psalm to thank and praise God, get this, even before he reaches land, even before he knows for sure he will save, he has already thanked God. He says, I know you will save me. I know I will see your temple again. I know that you've rescued me. And I don't even have to be on land to know that you will put me there. That's faith. That's an understanding of God that, that, you know, in this kind of a situation, in the belly of a fish, in the grossest part of, you know, a storm, you know, that they being swallowed like this, to have that kind of faith and understand that I can thank God before it even happens. You know why? That's how much trust and confidence I know in God. I don't even have to reach land to construct a psalm of thanksgiving and praise for Him. Even before Jonah has reached land, he's already said it. Jonah chapter 2, verse 4. I said, yes, on the one hand, I am driven away from your sight, in verse 4. Yet, I shall look again upon your holy temple. That's what I have confidence in. This faith, this confidence in God to believe that he will see God's temple again, that means that he will be back in Jerusalem again. That's, that's how far his faith goes. He says, I know I will be back in Jerusalem again. You know, before, before he has even reached land, that's incredible. You look at a situation, you go like, dude, you're in the middle of the ocean. We don't know where this fish is going. How do you, how do you even get in your mind that you're going to see Jerusalem again? You know? But Jonah knows. Jonah knows. He says, I know what I've been saved from. I know where I'm going, and I will see it again. This is how much Jonah knows and how much he trusts God. This is how certain Jonah is of his salvation because of the mercy of God. You know, when all is said and done, despite knowing that, you know, despite knowing God really well, Jonah, Jonah plays a dangerous game of rebellion. Jonah, and this is, this is going to be for us today, Jonah plays a dangerous game of re rebellion because not even he himself initially, not even he himself could be sure that God would save him once he was cast into the sea. Old Testament literature shows us that every time somebody was cast, nobody came back from it. Right? Well, except for Joseph, but that was kind of a, a weak version of cast. They, they wanted to kill him if he wasn't going to be rescued by his brothers. But no one else, no one else survived the cast. Right. In fact, in verse 4, we see that Jonah himself already thought that he was a dead man. He said, I, will, I, will, you know, I am banished from your sight. So my point is that if you're doing something in life that you know is active rebellion against God, you know that, that you're either saying something or participating in something, that you know, you know, um, I'm already having conscience issues about this, so this, I'm not even sure if this is right. You know, if, if you're even having that kind of active rebellion before God, you know, now's the time for us to examine our hearts and to repent of it now. I mean, it's either that or we continue to do what we're doing, make, take a chance and say, okay, maybe this is okay with God, maybe it's not, until you find yourself in an ocean. But the whole point of the passage is to say that the ocean is completely avoidable. It was completely avoidable. If Jonah had just initially repented on the ship and said, I'm sorry, Lord, maybe things would have been different. But he, re he refused. He said, throw me overboard, and this, this storm will stop for you. Like, I am you know, the cause of everything. I will be your solution. I will be your salvation, sailors. You know, and God said to him, you know, the salvation, no one, man. In fact, you need salvation. Right? If, we if we persist in our rebellion, it'll take us one of two ways. And if we're not sure... Either it, we will throw ourselves in the ocean, which is completely avoidable, or we could say, look, Lord, I want you, I want to live for you, and just avoid this ocean completely. We want to save ourselves from being thrown in an ocean. We don't know whether God is going to save us from our sins. We don't know whether he will save us with a fish or whether he will let us feel the full weight of the consequences of those sins. This is why it's important not to gamble when it comes to sin. So let's never become too complacent. Let's never become so used to the idea and we say, well, God is kind, God is merciful, God is loving, God is gracious, God is patient. 
God will never judge us. That's, that's lying to ourselves. That, that's something that, that's playing with fire. That's dangerous. Even Paul himself says, that is not true. It is not true that, 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 that even though God is all those things, it is not true that God will not be just as well. Because Paul says God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. Before he even going to throw you in an ocean, he's trying to already give you an opportunity to stop yourself, right? Romans chapter 2, verse 4. You know, Paul is saying to the Jews, to the Roman church, do you presume on the riches of God's kindness and forbearance and patience? Don't you know that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? He's being very patient with you for the point that you will repent. Otherwise, he will throw you into an ocean. And then what? 50-50 chance whether you survive or not. So let's not presume to take God's kindness for granted. Yes, Jesus died on the cross to save us from our sins, but Jesus' expectations after he died on the cross is that we now live for God. And so we should not be continued, living in continued rebellion towards God. So as we go to time of meditation and prayer, let's think about our new identities in Christ. That if we are people who are now free from sin, if we say, I am now in Christ, I am now free from sin, then we must be people who must submit ourselves to living righteously. Well, we can't just be talkers and say, yeah, yeah, I'm a Christian, and not live like a Christian. You know? uh, we have to be those who are consistent, who both say we are for Christ and, and those who live for Christ. Because this is, this is what Paul says in Romans chapter 6, verses 16 to 18. This is what Paul says in Romans 6, 16, verse 18. And I'm only going to read verse 16. Do you, not know that if you're that, do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, that you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness? If you present yourself to anyone as obedient slaves, you are going to be slaves to one, or, or, or one of two things, either sin, which is going to lead to death, or obedience, which is going to lead to righteousness. Oh, someone switched it for me. But thanks be to God, that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, you have now become slaves of righteousness. That's our new standard. Okay? It's no longer this, this, this open rebellion towards God. It doesn't matter if you're uh, you know, God's number one prophet. It didn't even matter to Lucifer. He was the, the number one angel. You know, if you... you uh, disobey God, there are severe consequences. Even Moses. Moses couldn't be perfect. Right? He even got punished and, had to, and couldn't enter the promised land. So if, if all these people you know, are, are, are rebelling against God and we think that, that they can't even escape punishment, what's going to happen to us when we're not even at their level? You know, we're not going to escape punishment either. I guess you can say, if you were to read this text, I guess you can say, yeah, well, Jonah was pretty lucky. <laughs> well, Jonah was only lucky because God was still willing to use him. Jonah was only lucky because God was still willing to use him. If God said, fine, I'll find another way, he would have let Jonah drown. So if I were to advise you as to how to live life, if you were to ask me for advice, or Kim would even come in as a father, and you say, like, what's your advice for how to live life? I'd say, you know, if, if you're going to gamble, if you're going to gamble at all, go for the sure thing. Always go for the sure thing. And the sure thing is this. Those who seek to live righteously, those who seek to live righteously, you will never be far from God. If you choose to live righteously, you are never far from God. Or put it a different way, I mean, those who live righteously, God is never far from you. God will never be far from you. So let's go to time of meditation and prayer. We are supposed to be slaves of righteousness. Let us renew that, that sentiment to God. Through prayer. Let's pray.